Okay, this is Wednesday night Bible study. It is September 30th. Thank God that you can watch this on tape delay, but I'm doing it live at seven o'clock. It won't be long for two reasons. One is we're at the end of the chapter and Jesus just has a little bit left to say to the Pharisees before he leaves the temple. And secondly, the Lakers are playing. Go Lakers! So it won't be long, but, only, but it just worked out that way. Okay, so we're in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, we're in the last several verses of it, just the last few verses. Jesus has been challenged by four groups. The Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Four different groups have come at him. The Pharisees are the ones who are really in charge of tradition. Now, these people all exist till today. They're not called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Herodians, and the scribes, but they exist in the church and in the world. Um, and so, <clears throat> and they're still coming against Jesus. The Pharisees were very concerned with maintaining tradition. And so there are people in the church who were very concerned with maintaining tradition. Uh, and if it's not done, you know, if the forefathers didn't do it, why are you doing it? Um, now, the Pharisees came to Jesus, I'm just reminding you, this is after Jesus had gone to the temple and turned over all the tables. Then he went outside and they looked at the fig tree and they go, oh, look, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday, it's all dried up. He says, yes, and so was Israel. Well, he didn't say it like that, but that's what he was implying. Yes, it is. Then he came back the next day and he's teaching the temple like nothing happened. So the Pharisees approached him in the temple. They're afraid to kick him out because he had just gone wild yesterday. And plus the people were supporting him. So they thought, well, we'll just embarrass him. So the Pharisees asked him, like, by what authority are you doing this? Who gave you this authority? Because we're, we're the Levites, and we're from the tribe of Levi, and we have the right to come into the temple and to do the sacrifices. And what gave you the right to turn up the tables? And why are you teaching? And who, 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 who do you think you are? And so um, here's Jesus' deal. If you don't want a real answer, he's not going to give you one. He's the, Jesus is the one that came up with why cast your pearls before swine. Some people in your life don't really want an answer. They just want to stop you from doing what you're doing. They're, it's not worth getting into a discussion with them because they don't care what you have to say. They've already got their minds made up and you're wrong. So Jesus asked them, okay, what authority was John the Baptist doing what he did? Because John the Baptist was baptizing people. What, who gave him that authority? And then they stopped. Remember they said, oh, okay, if we say God gave him that authority, then he's going to say, then why didn't you go and repent? Because John was saying everybody's going to repent. So if you think God was something to do that, and if we say man gave him that authority, then the people are going to be mad at us because they think John really was sent by God. And so we're not, we're not going to give you an answer. And Jesus said, but then I'm not going to give you an answer. Because you really just want to shut me up. You don't really want to have a real discussion. Because you do have an opinion, but you don't want to give it. So I can't really talk with you about it. So this fight versus went up. And uh, so they sent the Herodians to them. The Herodians were the people who were very concerned with government, very concerned with politics, very concerned with how all this was going to look to Caesar and to the Romans. So they came to Jesus, remember, and say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Because hmm, they're ready to trap him. If you say, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, then the Romans can come and take him away. And if they say, yes, we should pay our taxes to Caesar, then, then, the, then the church members can go, what, you support Caesar? Because they were very split. It was very in to be split. It was very in to say, oh, we hate that group. No, you're wrong. And Jesus is like, I'm not in it. My name is Bennett. I'm not in it. So Jesus says, Who's, uh, show me Caesar's money. Whose subscription, whose uh, image is on that Caesar? Well, then give Caesar's what Caesar's. But give God what's God. I'm not, you guys can have your own fight, but there's two separate kingdoms. There's Caesar's kingdom and there's God's kingdom. And that's what I'm trying to explain that I'm here to promote. I'm not here to promote Caesar or take Caesar out. I'm not involved in politics. I'm involved in the kingdom building. Is this going to get somebody saved is my, is my worry. And not, you know, how's it going to excite Caesar or not excite Caesar. So the Herodians had nothing else to say to him. Then the Sadducees came and they said, because Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And they're trying to trap Jesus, you know. Uh, we're going to show Jesus how foolish and ideal that the resurrection is. And so they said, you know how uh, if, if a widow has a husband and he dies, then the brother is supposed to marry her. Well, okay, there was a widow who had seven husbands. They all died. What should we do? And Jesus said, 
kill that. No, I'm kidding. He said, uh, she needs to stop getting married. No, he didn't say that either. He said, you don't understand what the resurrection's about. That's not going to be an issue in the resurrection. Because they're thinking, well, this will prove there's no resurrection. Jesus was going to go, you know, I never thought of that. Oh, my God. Yeah, how's that going to work? The resurrection must not be true. And Jesus is like, no, the resurrection is true. You just don't get it. You don't understand the resurrection. You don't understand the power of God. You don't believe in angels. You don't understand these trivial things that worry us down here. That's not what's happening. And that's not even going to be an issue. So zip it. Zip. So, the, so the Sadducees walked away. Then the scribes came up. Actually, one scribe. But I'm sure he had friends. And the scribe came up and said, okay, what's the greatest commandment of all? The scribes are the one. Okay, I'm sorry. The Sadducees were the, were the ones concerned with the... Um, the sacrifices in the temple, maintaining the sacrifice. They were just, if you do everything that the law, and so interesting enough, they were really concerned with the law, Moses' law, and didn't believe in anything after Moses' law. They believed in the first five books of the Bible and nothing else. And so that's, so they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe any sort of prophetic words, Isaiah, Jeremiah, eh, I didn't believe in any of that. And there are some people like that who've confined themselves to one section of the Bible. We don't believe in the book of Acts. Miracles, uh, speaking in tongues, all that. We don't believe in that. We only believe in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so there are Christians who have combined themselves to the four Gospels. And anything that happened after that, they're not in it. They don't believe it. And so that's what the Sadducees were. Again, and the scribes were concerned with how the church was in the community. They were the lawyers. And so they weren't concerned with what happened inside the church. They were totally concerned with what happened outside the church and how it affected the community. And, and all of, so that's why they said, what's the greatest commandment of all? So they weren't concerned with the sacrifice. They weren't concerned with the tradition. But what part of Moses' law affected how we deal with each other in a civil society? So what's the greatest commandment? What should we be, forget about the sacrifice and all that stuff. What should we be doing as believers? And Jesus says, well, and he answered them. Now notice he tripped everybody up. up. But this guy, he really answered because this guy was genuinely asking, what should we be doing? And so Jesus says to him, uh, the greatest commandment is that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. You've got to love God, give him above everything, more than you love your car, more than your house, more than you love everything. Love him the most. And then the second is like that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these two man commandments hang all the law of the prophets. I mean, everything just comes from that. If you love God with your heart and love your neighbor with all your heart, and by the way, your neighbor is that Samaritan who is in the opposite party of yours and doesn't believe the way you do, who, who is your enemy, who, who says stuff that you hate, that's your neighbor. Because when he said this, the Samaritan, they were like, the Samaritans, because they hated the Samaritans. He says, yeah, that's who your neighbor is. So that's who you got to love. Because it's easy to love the person who's lovely and gives you pies and you know, makes clothes for you. Like, how hard is that? But, but the love, but see, God loved us. This is while we were yet sinners, while we were cursing him, while we were hating God, God sent his son to die for us. Jesus is there dying for all these people that are attacking him. People who are trying to stone him, the people about to put him on the cross. Jesus is dying for them. And so he's our example. So Jesus is like, you got to love your neighbor. That If you do that, you don't have to worry about memorizing every law and every commandment and every genealogy. And every, oh, you don't have to, just love God, love your neighbor, you will fulfill the commandments. So in Mark, Mark recorded the guy's reaction. Uh, in Mark 12, he says, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. Now, again, Mark is the one that said that the guy was genuinely coming up to him. Matthew was like, oh, that guy, he had something. He was trying to test him. And I don't blame Matthew for thinking that because three groups had come and tried to test Jesus. But Mark said the guy was genuine. And Mark says he answers him by saying, well said, teacher, for you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So this is what the scribes said. Like, doing, you know, you can sacrifice all you want and then still go out and be the devil. And, and, and you know, and, and we do that today. Well, I gave $100 in church, so the, now I can cuss people out the freeway and God doesn't care. Yeah, he does. He doesn't care about all our sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. All your sacrifice and all this, that doesn't impress God. But are you loving your neighbor? So he says, to love the neighbor as oneself and to love God, that's better than the whole burnt offering and the sacrifices. And verse 34 of Matthew, of Mark 12, Jesus says, 
Now, when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And then Mark says, and then after that, no one dared ask him any question. Well, that's how Peter remembered it. And again, Peter is the one that told Mark all these stories. But that's not really what happened. So he did say that to the man. You, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Like, hey, you got the, you're on the right. You, of all these people that approach me, you scribe, you lawyer, you're actually in the right direction. So in Matthew, he remembers that there was one more thing that Jesus did before everybody else got scared. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 41, it said, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. So after the scribe, Jesus went over to the Pharisees. He asked them this question. And he said, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one who's coming? Whose son is he? So they said to him, well, he's the son of David. Now, Jesus, interestingly, was also from the genealogy of David. And, and everybody knew that Jesus was of David's line. That's kind of why they were questioning him. Like, you're from the line of Judah, because David's from the line of Judah, but you're not a Levi. So you're not really allowed to go into the temple and do everything you're doing. And Jesus is like, oh, if you only understood. So... Um, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 15, we talked about this like for two seconds last week. I just glanced it and zoomed right over it. It says that after Jesus healed somebody in the temple, so after he'd thrown everybody else out of the temple and through other tables, the people who were left there, the poor and all that, who were totally going with their needs unmet because they were so the priests were so focused on the money and money changing hands and doing all the stuff that there are all these blind and like, yeah, 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 we'll get to you, but let's get this money in which sounds familiar. After that, they came to Jesus after once he kicked them all out and Jesus healed them. And verse 15, it says, and when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Now again, everybody knows Jesus is from the tribe of David, but David has had lots of sons and grandsons and great grandsons and great. So the Pharisees are like, well, yeah, he's a son of David, but he's not the son of David. So, it says, they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. It says the Pharisees were sore displeased. And in verse 16 of Matthew 21, and they said to him, hearest thou what they say? And Jesus said unto him, yeah. Have you not heard or read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? Didn't you? The kids are going to say, so that's, that's what that scripture means that they're giving correct praise and so that you because they're like shouldn't you rebuke those children no because they're saying what god told them to say okay so so they're mad because yeah you're a son of david but you're not the son of david and uh and, and again everybody knew uh, in, in matthew 1 1 in matthew 1 1 it says this is the book of the generation of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham and in Matthew 17, they can go through the whole gene genealogy so that all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations and all the generations from David unto they, when they were carried away to Babylon and the temple was destroyed the first time was 14 generations. And from Babylon to Jesus was 14 generations. And they knew exactly it was three sets of sevens, right? So there's a seven set. There's a last set of seven that's coming up. But, but, but all these generations had, had passed and they could taste Jesus' line all the way from David, all the way to Jesus. Again, yeah, we know you're the son of David, but you're not the son of David. So when he asked them, who's, who's, who's the Christ? Whose son of he? They said, well, yeah, he's the son of David. But what are you getting at? Um, and here's, here's the, the uh, scripture that they're pulling from. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, uh, Nathan prophesies to David and says, when your days are fulfilled, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So you're going to have a son, a child after you, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So they know he, David had gotten this prophecy that he's going to have a son who's going to come and establish his kingdom. And that's what the disciples were waiting for. That's what the Pharisees were waiting for, although they didn't think it was Jesus. But they said, there's a king coming. There's a there's a man coming. So they're waiting for some man who's going to come and overthrow the Romans and establish the Jewish kingdom. So, so, they, so they think that there's an anointed one coming from David's body, a man, 
a human who's going to be anointed, who's going to establish a kingdom, an earthly kingdom. And in fact, in, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, which means a, a shoot, like from the, the trunk of his, you know, Jesse. And of course, the, 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 the trunk of Jesse was David. That was his son. And from that branch shall grow out, a, 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 and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest up in him. He'll be anointed, right? The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, these are the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. This is just another way of, of qualifying them. If you know about the gifts of the Spirit, they, they are three vocal gifts, three power gifts, and three gifts of revelation. So the gifts of revelation are the spirit of discerning, the, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, where God gives you a, a special revelation, uh, ability to see into the spirit world, or it gives you a revelation of some future event or some past event. So it calls it a word of knowledge or word of wisdom. There are the vocal gifts where you, where out of your mouth will spout spew wisdom. It's manifested in uh, prophecy or speaking of tongues or, or, uh, or uh, the interpretation of tongues. And then there's power that comes, that might come up when the Spirit of God comes upon you, which is uh, manifested in the, the gifts of, of healings, gifts of working of miracles, or special faith. Now, that special faith should just believe a, a special thing. Everybody has faith. But um, when it's talking about in 1 Corinthians, the gifts of the Spirit, you might have special faith where God may talk to you and say, I want you to drive your car into the ocean and it's going to just part before you. Well, that takes special faith. You better be sure God's talking to you. Ah. So um, these are the three manifestations, vocal gifts and our power gifts, our gifts of revelation. And he's saying the spirit of all of it's going to rest on him. This anointed that's coming from Jesse, the son of David, will be anointed with wisdom and understanding. That's revelation. Counsel, that's words of wisdom coming out of his mouth. And might, that's the power gifts. Strength, um, spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, which is where the, where the special faith comes from. You have to have a special awesome and reverence of the Lord, and that's all going to rest on him. All those gifts will rest on this one person who's going to establish his kingdom. So they're thinking David's this anointed person. He's the son of David, right? He's coming from David. So he said, yes, yes, David's going to have a son. It's not you, but he's going to have a son, this man who's going to establish his kingdom, and he'll be anointed of God. Okay, so he said to them in verse 43, how then does David in the spirit, when he was in the spirit, call him Lord? If it's just his physical son saying the Lord, and he's quoting Psalm 110. The first verse of Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord. So the Lord, these are two different words for Lord. Jehovah said to my Lord, Adonai. So the Lord said these words to my Lord. Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. It's always funny that he has to sit actually on his hand. But he means on my right side. And until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he's saying, if that's his son... Jesus said, why is he calling him Lord? What? And then it's like, oh, wait. Yeah, how can his son also be his Lord? And it says uh, the Pharisees couldn't figure that out because they're waiting for a man to come, a man to come. And Jesus is trying to point out to them he's also going to be God. He's going to be God. You think there's a man coming in, but he's also going to be God. Remember my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord. How can, if he's that's his son, why is he saying you're my Lord? You're my Lord. So do you not understand that when the Messiah comes, he's not just going to be a man. I know you're looking for a man, but you need to understand this concept that he will also be God. Now, how's like God going to be in heaven and God be on earth at the same time? And that's what Jesus is asking. How can my Lord say, to, how can the Lord say to my Lord? How, how can God be in heaven and be in earth? They don't, they couldn't figure that out, right? Um, in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, there was a king who was having this difficulty. Um, he wanted to do the wrong thing so badly, and God was trying to stop him. He, this king is wanting to go to war and get involved in this war, and God's like saying, don't do that, don't do that, dude, don't, don't do that. And so um, it's Ahaz. Ahaz is wanting, he's, he's really trying very hard to do the wrong thing, and so the prophet comes on to him. It's in, in verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 7, it's this 
Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Like, if, if you don't believe me, ask for a sign. Like, in the depth of below or in the sky. Like, I'll do, I'll, I'll put a rainbow in the sky. I will turn the water to blow. I'll do whatever you want, God is saying, if you'll just ask for a sign. In verse 12 says, but Ahad said, oh, I will not ask, I won't test the Lord. And he's like using this scripture which says you should not test the Lord. But that's not what that scripture means, you know. But he's, he, because he didn't want, he already had his mind made up. He already had his mind made up. He was going to do it. So when God says, ask for a sign, like, oh, I, well, I would never ask for a sign. Because what if God actually gave him a sign? He'd have to, you know, <laughs> he would already knew what he wanted to do. So now the Lord is frustrated because Ahaz represents all the people who think they already know. I already know. Don't tell me. I know who Jesus is. I already know. I already know. There are people among us today when we're, we're as Christians, we're going out and preaching to the world. Yes, he was a good man. Yes, he was just a man. And it's like, and that's what everything's going to hang on. In the end, that's what our eternity will hang on. And people's eternal fate. Was Jesus just a man or was he God? If he was just a man, then he was a crazy man who thought he was God. But if he was God and you don't listen to what he was saying, he holds your fate in his hand. And that's what everything resides. He, if he's God then you, we have to listen. If he was just a man, you don't have to listen to him. A lot of men have come claim, claiming lots of stuff. So God is mad at Ahaz because he wouldn't ask for a sign. So he says, then he said, here now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Like, I get that you just frustrating man, but you're going to weary God too? He says, therefore, the Lord himself will just give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and should call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. That's, he's going to be your sign. He's going to be the sign that everybody has to deal with. God, who we always think, he's God in heaven, God in heaven. But guess what? He was also here at the same time. How can that be? And today I was thinking about this, uh, like if there was just a bowl of water, like there was no other water on earth, just this one little bowl of water. That's, that's all that exists on earth. Just that's it. It's all in one bowl. And I took a third of it and put it in the cup and froze it. So now it's solid. So I can handle it. I can touch it. It's still water. It's just in solid form. I can take another third of it and I can boil it. And as it's boiling, it's turning into this mist. And now mist is getting on me and it's getting on my wife. It's getting this person and that person. It's spreading out, touching everybody. It's still water. It's just in a different form. But how can, how can that be? Water can only look like that. No, you can... You can put it in a form so that's solid and it can be touched and handled. You can put it in a form so that everybody can, it can just be on everybody. It's still water. And they couldn't, like, God can't be in heaven and also be on earth. Yes, he can. He just came down in this fleshly body so we can touch him and talk and handle him and listen to him and hear from him. And the Pharisees just couldn't get that. You are looking for some son of David, some man. And I'm telling you, he's God and that's my authority to be in the temple because it's my temple. I don't have to be from the tribe of Levi. I don't, you, you're asking me whose you know, coin should I, is it Caesar's coin? No, you need to give me the honor that's due me. You know, give to God what is due him. He, he's answering everybody's questions by trying to explain the answers to everything that you're asking me uh, is I'm the Lord. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I understand the resurrection because I saw the Satan fall from lightning, you know, fall from the sky like lightning. I understand stuff that you don't understand. You're challenging me because you really don't want an answer. So uh, he, when he explained and said, so how can David call his son Lord? How can he be both? And he wants them to go, oh, because his son's going to be the Lord. But they just like, I don't know. Because they just won't accept that possibly in front of him was God. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 46, it says, well, no man was able to answer him a word because they wouldn't stretch out their minds. It doesn't say that. It just says no man was able to answer him a word. Neither dare any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So that was their, if it, I refuse to change, I refuse to think any differently, so I'm done. And, but we've got to be open to teaching, to learning, to hearing new things. We can't just walk away when we don't understand. We say, Lord, teach me. Open my mind, stretch my mind, and we've got to pray for the world, communicate to the world that their minds will be open to the fact that God was among us, God is among us, that he's real, and that's our message.
That's our message to the world. What are you going to do with Jesus, the man and Jesus who was God? Okay, so that's all we're doing for tonight. And then, because right after that, Jesus left the temple and, and got into an amazing discourse. So we're going to get into that uh, next week. And some of you I will see on Sunday at 10 a.m. And some of you are watching this late at night after the Lakers game. I hope it was good news. Okay, so I'm going to end the live video. Amen.